The city behind me is New York, the largest city in the United States. New York is located just about at sea level. It has an elevation of about 10 meters or 33 feet. The city of Denver is much higher. Denver, Colorado has an elevation of 1,700 meters. That's more than 5,000 feet above sea level. But Denver is not the highest city, not by far. La Paz, Bolivia is more than 3,600 meters above sea level. That's almost 12,000 feet. That elevation is so high that if you travel from New York to La Paz in one day, when you arrive, you might need oxygen when you step off the plane. Otherwise, you could faint. People live in so many locations around our planet, from sea level to the tops of mountains. But what's the highest elevation where people can live permanently? Could we survive on top of Mount Everest? I'm Math Dad. I'm Science Mom. And today, we're going to find out. Welcome! Today we are going to be learning all about the layers of our atmosphere. And to start off with, I want to give a special welcome to those who are watching live. Welcome to you if you're watching the replay. I see Andrew and Mindful Mission and Remington Wolf, Megan, um, Ryan and from Ottawa, Canada. Welcome, you guys. I've seen some good questions already in the chat and I'm pretty curious what our answer is going to be. Are you going to tell us now or do we have to wait? you got to wait just a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, I want to review that we learned last time. Our atmosphere is not 100% nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, although those gases make up most of our atmosphere. And that's a good thing, because if that was all we had in our atmosphere, we'd live on a freezing cold planet. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have something called greenhouse gases. And we learned that the three most important greenhouse gases were, do you remember math, Dad? Water vapor. Water was one of the greenhouse gases, right? Yes, water vapor right there in the middle. Um, and we also had? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. And methane. And methane. Those are three of the gases that are greenhouse gases. They're in very small amounts, but they help warm our planet and make sure that we are able to have an environment where life can exist. Of course, too much of those greenhouse gases are a problem, but we need some amount. So last time we learned about the gases on our atmosphere, but today we're going to talk about what happens when we go up in elevation. Ooh, if we could start flying like Superman, what, what would we experience? Well, and what happens when you live at higher elevation? Oh, yeah. So, and in the chat, I was seeing a couple different comments about where people live. Some people live at high elevation. We even have some students from Colorado. Others live at sea level. And if you travel from sea level, from New York, all the way to La Paz, Bolivia, which is the highest capital city in the world, what do you think happens, Math Dad, and why? Well, your legs get tired from, from going so high. Um, but so what, what the differences? Um, why Why would someone need oxygen when they get off the plane at La Paz, Bolivia? Oh, that's that's right. We said that in the video. It's because is it because there's just less oxygen there that they're breathing? There is. There is less oxygen, and it doesn't mean that there is not twenty one percent oxygen anymore. There's twenty one percent oxygen at sea level. So if those little green ones are oxygens in this little picture, here's sea level and you have 20%-ish oxygen. Okay. If you go up to a really high elevation, you still have 20%-ish oxygen, but do you have as much? No. No, because the molecules are spread further apart. So there's less air there? Less air, period. Whoa. The air, is, the air molecules are spread further apart. There is less air, and that's why people experience a change when they go to high elevation. And if you go too high too fast, then you can faint, you can get sick, you can get a headache, you can get altitude sickness. But if you do it slowly, then your body adjusts. So the people that live there don't have to go around with oxygen tanks. That's right, that's right. If you uh. live in La Paz, Bolivia, your body has adjusted to the high elevation by producing more red blood cells, more hemoglobin in those red blood cells too, and by making your blood just a little bit thicker so that it moves in a different way and you get more oxygen delivered to your body. But there is a limit to how high we can go and still make those adjustments. So in, in the chat, somebody said like the, the phrase vanishing into thin air, like as, as a balloon would float up. Just, yes. just the air actually is getting thinner. It is getting thinner. As we go higher and higher, the air gets thinner and thinner. And that means there's a limit to how high human beings can go and still be alive. 
the highest city in the world, or the highest, I shouldn't say city, the highest place where people are able to live permanently, guess how high it is, Math Dad? Well, um, but it's at least as high as La Paz was. So I don't know. Is it 4,000, 5,000 5, meters, 6,000 meters? It is also in Peru, and it is La Riconda, not La Riconada. Oh. It is 5,100 meters. That's 16, more than 16,000 feet above sea level. Man, so big. But this is right at the limit of where people can live. This is a B small B Bolivia and Peru. Town. Are these are the Andes Mountains? Yes. Down in, okay. Yes, this is right at the limit of where people can live. This town, La Riconada in, in Peru, it one in four people that live in this town actually suffer from chronic mountain sickness because it is so high and because the oxygen levels are so low. So it's a small little mining town and pretty much the only people that visit this town are the miners and a scientist who want to better understand what happens when people don't have enough oxygen and how their bodies react. But that is the highest. And if we go higher than that, because Mount Everest is much higher than if we cross into what's known as the death zone, things get really bad. Oh, did you say death zone? Yes. The elevation of 8,000 meters, that's around 26,000-ish square feet, once, one, oh, just feet, thank you, Math Dad. Once you cross above that level, there is so little oxygen that your cells start to die. 8,000 8, meters or so? Mm -hmm. Right now, you are alive because your body is a factory of chemical reactions, and those chemical reactions must have oxygen. And every breath you take, is putting oxygen into your blood so that your cells can stay alive. And if you go above 8,000 meters, there's not enough oxygen. Even though the air is still 21% oxygen, the air is so thin, there's not enough oxygen to power those reactions that your body needs to stay alive. Okay, that's crazy. The death zone really sounds scary, yes. and apparently it's for a good reason. It is, so this is why K2 and Mount Everest are both very dangerous mountains to climb because once you get up above that elevation, you can only be there for a few hours without really, really bad effects. Man. And if you stay there too long, it actually is fatal. But but uh, I've flown on airplanes before that flew as high as Mount Everest. You have, but the airplane was pressurized. When you fly on an airplane, you take off and the, the elevation that you're at, whatever elevation, that's what the air pressure is that you're used to. But when you take off and fly up into the air, the airplane is pressurized with extra air in it so that you don't fall unconscious because otherwise flying at 33,000 feet above sea level, that would be a terrible experience. All the passengers and the pilot would <laughs> fall unconscious and that would not be good. That's right. Well, yeah. If you get on a plane, you know, the flight attendants talk about the oxygen that could come down. That, that's why they're giving yes, you that warning. Yes, because if the pressurization failed, if all of a sudden the air pressure left the cabin, then you would need oxygen in order to stay conscious. Okay. And so, so when you say it's pressurized, that's like capturing the air when it's thicker and, and holding it in so that it doesn't thin out as we go high. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Just like if you blow up a balloon, the balloon is staying inflated because there's pressure inside the balloon. And then if you open up the balloon and let the air out, the air is gonna rush out. Same thing with an airplane. If a window or a door on the airplane broke, a lot of that air inside the airplane is gonna go out just how it would escape from a balloon. Whoa. Because the pressure outside the balloon is lower than the pressure inside the balloon if you've blown a balloon up. Like a lot of stuff would get sucked out of this hole, kind of like a vacuum? Yes. I want to I want to show and explain real quick our first three layers, and then we have a couple of fun experiments we're going to do to help us better understand what pressure is and how air pressure works. So first, let's go to the notes. We are on page nine, nine of the notes. And I want to talk real quick about height because we are going to be talking a lot about elevation when we're talking about the atmosphere and the layers of the atmosphere. And it's good to sort of appreciate just the scale of the height that we're dealing with. So Yao Ming is one of the tallest human beings around, a famous basketball player. He's 2.29 meters tall. That's more than seven and a half feet. But compared to a Brachiosaurus, seven and a half feet is not that tall. A Brachiosaurus is a lot taller. Yeah. Well, if we slide over and look at a coastal redwood tree, <gasps> now our Brachiosaurus looks kind of small because a coastal redwood tree is much bigger. It is. They're crazy tall. Yes. I meant to see them. But compared to the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world right now, 
that coastal redwood looks pretty small. <laughs> that is crazy the Burj tall. Khalifa is really tall. But compared to Mount Everest, well, that Burj Khalifa does not look so tall anymore. Mount Everest is more than 8,000 meters above sea level, 29,000 feet above sea level. That's really, really big. <laughs> oh, that's the death zone, right? Yes. Over 8,000 meters. Yeah, right, right around here. Well, no, I do have too high. Death zone. But Mount Everest is tall, but clouds can be even taller. There are plenty of clouds that are lower than Mount Everest, but the tallest clouds can actually go up above Mount Everest. They can be up to 21,000 meters tall. That's incredibly tall. And when we're talking about the atmosphere, you might be thinking, whoa, it's so big and so tall. It just goes up forever and ever. Well, compared to us, yes, the atmosphere is huge. Yeah. But compared to the size of the Earth, well, our atmosphere is fairly small. If you look at the Earth and say, okay, how thick is the atmosphere compared to the entire Earth? It's just about identical to the thickness of an apple peel. If you slice an apple in half and look at the peel, that what? peel is about as thick as our atmosphere. Well, that can't be right, because look, look, the peel is just thin, like basically like the line that's drawn there. It is. Wait, uh, so you're saying that this line around the edge of the Earth is about as thick as the atmosphere? Exactly. Let me Whoa. show you a picture from space from um, that's, that's a, an open source picture from NASA. There you can see the atmosphere. And just imagine, you can see that curve is just a slight little curve. Imagine filling it all out and seeing how big the Earth is. So kind the of that, that bluish mm -hmm. thing along the, the top edge of the Earth. There. Whoa. And just like an apple peel is essential for the apple, you know, without a peel, the apple is going to just wither up and shrink. The atmosphere is essential for life on Earth, but it is quite small in comparison to the size of the Earth. Now, what are the layers of the atmosphere? Uh -huh. We're going to go through these go through these real quick because they have names and we've divided our atmosphere up because something really important happens in this second layer. Our first layer is the troposphere. And the troposphere is where we fly airplanes, it is where we live, it is where all of our weather happens. Occasionally, you can have clouds that go above 10 kilometers and get up into the next layer, but really most of our weather, just about all of it, happens in the troposphere. So just a sec, if I jump back a page, if I were to draw the, where the troposphere falls here, would it be like right about the top of Mount Everest-ish? A, a little taller than Mount Everest. Just a little taller than Mount yeah. Everest? All right. Yep. So that's Mount, our... Mount Everest is a, a little over 8,000 um, kilometers high, and the troposphere goes up to about 10,000 kilometers. All right. Wow. Okay, cool. Troposphere, the bottom layer. Yes. And most of our weather and all of the, the things that we do as we live, that all takes place in this layer. This is where we live. The next layer, oh, and one more thing I need to tell you, I need you to know about the troposphere that's really important. In the troposphere, the air gets colder as you go higher. I've seen that before. Yeah. The lower you are, the warmer it usually yes, is. Yes. Yes. If you are down at sea level, it's going to be relatively warm, especially if you're near the equator. But if you get up to Mount Everest level elevation, up to 8,000 meters, it never gets above freezing. It is always really, really cold. But something interesting happens when we get to about 10,000 kilometers. Uh, feet. Sorry, sorry 10,000 meters. 10,000 yeah. meters. Thank you. Yeah, or 10 kilometers. When we get to about 10 kilometers above sea level, then the air stops getting colder. And this is why we have different layers of the atmosphere. If the air just got colder and colder the higher you went, and then you were in outer space, we would just have one layer to the atmosphere, probably. But as we're going up, the air is getting colder and colder, and then it stops getting colder, and it starts to get warmer. Whoa. And this is the stratosphere. The stratosphere is the layer of the atmosphere where the air is getting warmer as you go higher, rather than getting colder as you go higher. And the reason why it's getting warmer is because of the ozone layer. And we have an entire class where we're going to talk about the ozone layer. But just for a brief introduction right now, I want to tell you the ozone is O3, three oxygen molecules together. And ozone has a really cool ability to absorb radiation, split apart, and then absorb radiation again and form back together. So it's constantly absorbing radiation from the sun and going around in a cycle, blowing apart, coming back together, splitting apart, coming back together. And as it does that, it releases heat. So we, sh we could breathe ozone then because it's oxygen, right? 
breathing ozone would be terrible because ozone does split apart and form this little lone oxygen here. And if you have little free oxygens in your lungs, they'll be like, whoa, let's go destroy some cells. Let's break oh, up no. some DNA. <laughs> so breathing ozone is bad. We do not want to breathe ozone, but we're very glad that it's up in the stratosphere because it warms that layer and it absorbs harmful radiation. So, and when I say it warms that layer, it gets warmer, meaning it gets down to about zero degrees at the freezing level, oh. but compared to negative 65 degrees, which is where we were at in the troposphere, that feels warm, yeah. but it's not, it's not gonna feel warm to you if you go up in the stratosphere, it's gonna still be cold. <laughs> After the stratosphere, what do you think happens to the temperature? So we, we were getting colder as we got higher, yeah. and then we started getting warmer. So I'm guessing we're going to get colder again? We're going to get colder again. Right. And this next layer where we get colder again is called the mesosphere. The mesosphere is where meteorites burn up when they come into our atmosphere. So if you see a shooting star, you are seeing a piece of rock entering the mesosphere, and it's going so fast, it's hitting those air molecules, and there's so much friction that it actually burns up. And that's the way I like to remember mesosphere. Think meteorites, huh. mesosphere, MM. So sh shooting stars are just? Small little bits of rock from space that huh. burn up in the mesosphere. Cool. And next, we have the thermosphere. And the first three layers, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, those contain more than 99% of the air molecules around our planet. They are the majority of the air by far when it comes to just how many molecules we have. By the time you get to the thermosphere, it feels like this. See this view? Oh, let's go back to the big view real fast. So see this view behind us? We picked this backdrop today because it's like we're on the International Space Station and you can see the planet behind us. <laughs> the International Space Station orbits in the thermosphere. The air is so thin that it really feels a lot like outer space. It feels like a vacuum. You're only gonna have a few molecules every 100 kilometers, or sorry, every, every one kilometer. The molecules are so spread out, there might be up to a kilometer of space in between them. That's how thin the air is. Wow. But there still are air molecules. It's not completely outer space yet. So we call it the thermosphere because those molecules up there, they are moving very fast and they have a lot of energy. That's, that's really cool. And then last but not least, we have one more layer. Dun, 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 dun. The, we need to go back to our view so they can see your notes, Math Dad. Oh, man. They missed my beautiful notes. Sorry. The exosphere. The exosphere is our last layer. And the exosphere is where our satellites orbit. And this layer really looks and acts a lot like outer space. The molecules are so far apart, you'll only find them every few kilometers. You'll see a molecule so you, there. You can't even pretend to breathe at that height. Though. No. And you can't breathe in the thermosphere either or the mesosphere. The air is way too thin. Human beings, we can we can travel comfortably up to about right here. <laughs> and then, you know, we can really short and quick, we can go up to the death zone and back as long as we don't stay too long. But we can't go above this level. This little sign right here, that's the level to the to which human beings can travel. Any higher, and it's too high. Gotcha. All right. Now that we have reviewed our layers, let's do some experiments because math out. I have a couple fun activities for us to better understand pressure because this is one of the most important things for us to realize about air. Air takes up space and air has pressure. The first little challenge for you, math dad, is kind of a fun one. All right. I want to know. I have a bottle here with a balloon in it and the bottle's empty, right? Yep. So if bottle. I offered you a million dollars, Math Dad, could you blow up that balloon and have that balloon fill up the bottle? One million dollars? Mm -hmm. All right, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. It doesn't matter how strong you are. The strongest person in the world cannot blow up this, bo this balloon because this bottle is not empty. It's full of air. And that <sighs> air has a certain amount of pressure. And the pressure that someone's lungs can produce is never going to be enough to compress to that. overcome and compress that air and fill it up. Maybe for $2 million. Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's impossible. This could not be done. But if I hand you a different bottle that has a hole on the side, do you think you can do it then? I don't Let's know. turn this way. There's a little hole right there. <laughs> he did it. The entire balloon inflated, and while it was inflated, 
inflating, I could feel the air from the bottle pushing out from that hole. We just drilled a little hole in the bottom of this earlier. Yep, and it's a tiny little hole, but that hole was enough for the air to go out so that then the balloon could be blown up. Way cool. All right, we've got another one for you. You ready for number two? No, wait, 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 okay. So th th this is interesting. Um, what would happen if we flew to a higher elevation? If you would, flew to a higher elevation? Yeah, would, would this experiment, yeah, so we filled up these bottles right here, and then we went up high in the air. Good question. Would things have happened differently? Well, the first kind of interesting thing that would have happened, if we filled up, if we put this bottle like this at sea level, and then we drove up to maybe like 13,000 feet above sea level, this balloon would now be going up and would be filled up. There would be pressure inside the bottle because <laughs> these air molecules would be spread out more because there's less pressure at a higher so elevation. The, the ones outside the bottle are more spread out. Yes. So the ones inside the bottle would be They want to pushing. match. Yeah, they want to match. They're like, hey, everybody else is spread out. We want to spread out too. Okay. So if, if you guys are going up on a road trip into a mountain or something, you're changing elevation at some point, you got to try this. Put a balloon on your bottle and as you drive up, Yes, see if yep. it actually will work. Okay, and, and then what if we filled up the bottle when we were up high? And then when and you get back, it would be all crinkled in. Oops. Would the, the, oh, it, the, oh, the bottle would be The crinkled. bottle would actually or, or would the balloon inflate inside the bottle? Um, I've never tried it with a balloon. I've tried it with, you know, opening up at high elevation. You open up a bottle and then you screw on the lid. And then when you get back down to a low elevation, the bottle does crinkle in. But probably the balloon would fill up some of the bottle. Okay, and then what about this one where we had drilled a hole in the bottom? You're not going to see any change. No because, change. No because the air can move in and out. Gotcha. Good. Good question. All right. My next little experiment or challenge for you, Math Dad, I have a bottle that okay. has water in it. And I'm giving you some towels to put on your lap because I know you don't like messes. Wait, 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 wait. Towels? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> and what I want you to do is just blow a couple bubbles into this bottle. So put it down just a little bit lower. And that's okay. all you need to do. Blow a few bubbles real quick. Nope. <laughs> What happened? It squirted me in the face. I, I got water up my nose. <laughs> um, apologies about, about the water up your nose. I didn't intend for it to be quite that dramatic. But here's why water shot out of this bottle. We have clay around the straw. And it, when it, Math Dad it wanted revenge. <laughs> when Math Dad blew air into this bottle, he increased the pressure here. And then as soon as his mouth came off the straw, that pressure pushed down on the water and pushed the water through the straw. So basically the air that I blew in was essentially pushing Pushing back, the water back out. out. Yeah. Okay. And you can do the same thing with a juice box. You will <gasps> go to this, this view right here. I used to do this when I was a kid all the time, but I didn't really understand why it worked. So I have a juice box here that's mostly full of juice. And if I blow in the box, ah! then juice comes out. And of course, when I was a kid, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take my mouth off. I would drink all the juice and enjoy it just coming out. But I wanted <laughs> to show you that if you blow in, that air has pressure to it, and that air will push the juice out. Oh. Pretty cool, right? That, that is pretty cool. I mean, so when you squeeze on it, the air comes out as well. Well, if you're squeezing it, then you're making the volume, the space that's in there smaller. And of course, you're, you're just going to push it out. Gotcha. But if you blow in it, you're putting more air in that space up there. That air has pressure, and it pushes the liquid out. Oh, way cool. So same principle. Same principle. Are you ready for our third activity? Yeah. So for our third activity, all you need is a bottle of water and some ketchup. Okay. So this ketchup container here in this bottle is floating, but it's just barely floating. See how it's right at the top, but it's just barely floating? Mm -hmm. Now watch what happens if I squeeze it, Math Dad. Okay, I'm watching. <gasps> Which, I can, I witchcraft. Can make it sink to the bottom, and then <laughs> if I let go, then it slowly rises back up. No, it no, stays. Very slowly. Oh no, this ketchup packet is no longer performing. <gasps> shake it, shake it. Oh. There we go. <laughs> you let you let a little air out. And so then... here is how this is happening. The ketchup packet has ketchup, which is more dense than water. Ketchup by itself would just it would sink. sink. Yes. But there's also some air inside this ketchup packet, just a tiny bit. And when I push in, what happens is that pressure of me pushing in shrinks the air. 
And then when the air is smaller, now the ketchup packet is heavy enough to sink. But when the air is bigger, the ketchup packet is floating. So you can make it go down and then let it go and make it go up. <laughs> Are you ready to try this out, Math Dad? Yes. So this is my swimmer. I also have a water bottle for you. And I thought it would be fun if we tried a few different packets because ketchup is one condiment, but we also have barbecue sauce, Ooh. hot sauce, and soy sauce. All right. What do you think will happen with the soy sauce? Will this sink or float? Uh, I don't know. It feels about like water weight. I, I, I don't know. Maybe the chat has a prediction here. What's your prediction? Do you think this will sink or float? Hmm. Okay. I'm, I think it'll work. It's exactly the same. It sinks. What? Soy sauce is so salty. It has so much sodium. It's more dense. <gasps> oh, than is that water. Like salt water is more dense? Yes. Ah, okay. Our barbecue sauce, on oh. the other hand, that's floating. Okay. The hot sauce, let's see if it floats or sinks. Hot sauce also mm. floats. All right. And now our ketchup. In it goes, on, in ketchup. it goes. The ketchup oh. is also floating. And now if you are doing this, if you want to try this experiment at home, you need to make sure that the water goes all the way to the top of the container. So I'm going to pour just a tiny bit more water in here and make sure that we are all the way up to the very top. So you don't, don't want a, an air pocket? We don't want an air pocket. We want this to be completely full of water. Okay. And now it is the moment of truth. Whose ketchup packet will sink better? All right, here One, goes. two, three, squeeze. Oh, the barbecue sauce was sinking as well. Yeah. The hot sauce, not so much though. Now the hot sauce I think has too much air and it looks like it is not going to sink at all. But the barbecue sauce and the ketchup are doing well. Yeah. Are you ready for an advanced challenge? Okay. Can you get your ketchup packet to just hover in the middle? Ooh. Go down and don't touch the bottom. Don't touch the bottom. Just hover, hover. <laughs> Pretty cool. <sighs> and the reason this works is because air is compressible. A gas, you can squish that gas in and it can occupy a small space with higher pressure or a big space with lower pressure. But water is not compressible. So when I'm squeezing, the water molecules are not packing in close together. Mm. They're like, hey, you can squeeze as hard as you want. We're gonna stay the same. <laughs> but the little pocket of air inside this packet as soon as the pressure increases and I squeeze, that air pack is like, oh, we're gonna get smaller. We're gonna squish in and then the packet sinks. So they could totally do this one at home, right? Yes, yep, this is a good one to do at home. Always, of course, always ask for permission before you do science experiments at home, but this one is really pretty, pretty safe and fun and not too messy. Okay, so Kieran was asking, what would happen if you did this with sparkling water? Um, you will find different with sparkling water and um, juice and things, there's gonna be a different density. So this ketchup, I told you ketchup without any air in it would sink. If you mm. took all of the air out of the ketchup packet and then sealed it up again and put it in, it's gonna sink because there's a bunch of sugar and other stuff mixed in with the water that makes it heavier. And if you put this ketchup packet into soy sauce, it's gonna float really, really well because the soy sauce is super dense. So the sparkling water might have a slightly different density and I think it would be harder to get them to sink in sparkling water because you've got that dissolved gas. Mm. That's my guess though. I haven't tried it because sparkling water also might have sugar in it. Sugar would make it more dense. I don't know. Yeah, but by all means, try it out and let us know. I'll try and find out. All right, let's real quick, we're so, gonna do our where in the world mystery, a quick review of what we learned today and then we have some poll questions for you guys. Okay. So first, super fast review of what we learned Math Dad, if I show you a blank picture of our layers right here, <gasps> can you name them in order? Okay, okay. So the bottom layer was the troposphere. Yep. After the troposphere was the stratosphere. Yes. And then after the stratosphere was the mesosphere. Very well done. These are the first three layers of our atmosphere, and they're the ones that we care about the most, really, because that's where most of the air is and they're really important to protect us. Stratosphere has the ozone layer, mesosphere is where meteors burn up. And you said the troposphere, is that where most of the weather yes. was taking place? Pretty much all of our weather and all the clouds you see are going to be in the troposphere. Every now and then you might have really big clouds that po poke up above the troposphere, and there are really thin clouds that form in the stratosphere, stratosphere but those clouds have never produced rain. All of our weather takes place in the troposphere. And now, 
if you um, are have looked ahead in our notes on page 30, page 30 is where these where in the world mysteries come from. And our where in the world mystery for today, mm -hmm. the world's largest Buddhist temple has six squares and three circular platforms plus 504 Buddha statues. Mm. What is this place and where is it? Uh, it's in Asia. Asia is a good guess, but that's way too general. <laughs> way okay. too general. Yes. There's a trick for you guys. Just name the biggest continent and you might get it right. Um, this is a good question. Is it in India? Nope. Um, is chat going to help me out here? I need help. Um, <laughs> uh, where could it be? So in the notes, you've, you've got... You have these drawn out, right? We we do have these drawn out in the notes. And in fact, I will show wait, you know, I'll just I'll just tell you, Math Dad, since you're having a hard time. The answer is Borobudur in Indonesia. Borobudur. This this place, you guys, this is just an incredible building. It is enormous. Here is a picture to give you an idea of the scale. Oh wow. I mean, it's almost like its own mountain sculpted, <laughs> sculpted by people. And the the whole entire place is filled with the most intricate statues and carvings. And the cool thing about Borobudur is that it was it was a temple that was active, but then it was lost for a while and not really maintained or no one knew about it. And jungle kind of grew up around it. And then it was kind of rediscovered. Wow. So it went through a period of time where no one was really using it. And it's it's an incredible, incredible um, ruin and or not yeah, ancient place, incredible ancient place in Indonesia. And now we are ready for our questions. So I saw, thank you to Science Mom Liza for putting the item pool link. And if you're watching the replay, remember at science.mom slash earth science, if you just click right below the video, you can participate in these two. All right, so this is itempool.com slash science mom slash live. We are going to ask some questions. So if you head there in another tab, you're able to participate. And for our first question, which layer of the atmosphere do you live in? Hmm. Is it the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, or exosphere? Which mm -hmm. one? Science, math Dad, they're knocking this one out of the park. You see that? No, they're all missing it. They're getting it wrong. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sad to see them getting it wrong. But We, we had a great question where um, one of our students asked, what about the defeat dance? And I was planning on only doing the defeat dances during our game show reviews. But this question was so great, I thought, you know what? Today's the day. So wait, what? If they get all the <laughs> questions right, Math Dad, you are going to do the chicken floss. And oh no! If the <laughs> students miss a question, Math Dad will do a little victory dance. But we all want to see the chicken floss. So get these questions right. Nah, that's okay. They might get the first one right, but they, they won't get the others right. All right. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and finish and reveal. The answer is the troposphere, and that is correct. That is the layer that you live in, and me too. Nicely done. All right. Which layer of the atmosphere contains the ozone layer? Another easy one. They got this one in the bag. I don't know. I, don't know. I think that this one might stump them. I saw an excellent question um, from Open. Oh, I just I just forgot the name. The question was, how do you know when you get to another layer? Mm. And it is it is a really good question. And the answer is really the temperature difference. So if you're going up in the atmospheres, the temperature is getting colder and colder and colder, and then all of a sudden it pauses and it's not getting colder, that's the boundary between the troposphere and the next layer. And then if it's getting warmer, you know you're in the next layer. Yeah. And this means that the height of the layers changes. At the North Pole, it's going to be different than the equator, and different times of year, the boundaries change too. So we say the troposphere goes from sea level to 10, meter, 10 kilometers above sea level, but that's... That's kind of the average. It can be higher or lower depending on where you're at. Okay, maybe not such a firm yeah. line. All right, and they said the stratosphere. Stratosphere is correct. They, they got that one right. Okay, not, not bad, chat. Not Good bad. Good job. All right. In which layers of the atmosphere do planes fly? You got the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, the exosphere. Where do those planes fly? Ooh. Got one layer getting a lot of votes. And the second one getting some, but, hmm. 
Will they get it right? Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> All right, votes are in. And the correct answers were the troposphere and the stratosphere. Well done, well done. And of course, planes are flying in the troposphere because they take off and they're gonna take off from the troposphere. But most planes, most commercial flights, they like to fly right at that boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere because the air pressure is lower, mm. so you can go a bit faster. And you're also above where a lot of the turbulence is with weather. And it's a, yeah, good, good place to fly. That makes sense. Next question. Where does the International Space Station orbit? Which layer? Ooh. Is it in the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, or exosphere? Which of those five layers has the ISS? And this is the one where they go down. You keep thinking that if you want math, Dad, but no, I can see. They, 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 like they got a few of them right, but th this is the one that will stump them. You're just about getting hit in the head with that bar. <laughs> that's, that's a sure sign that the, the students have won. The undefeatable science kids have brought their A game. They've got this. We're gonna go ahead and finish and reveal. And don't worry if you didn't quite have time to enter in the answer. Remember, just you know, say it out loud. That helps. That helps a lot too. The thermosphere. Thermosphere is that, correct. That is where the International Space Station is at. So it, yeah. it's not as high as the satellites, which were off in the exosphere. Exosphere, right? Mm -hmm. And why do we call it the thermosphere? We call it the thermosphere because even though those molecules are spread really far apart, they have a lot of energy. They're moving very fast. So to us, if you were in the thermosphere, it would feel terrible. It would feel like the vacuum of outer space. But the air molecules that are moving, they have so much energy that their temperature is actually really high. All right, last question. Ooh, this is an interesting one. So if the door of the plane disappeared when it was flying at 35,000 feet. Or 10,000 kilometers. Oh, 10,000 10, meters, meters. Or 10 kilometers. Uh, typo. Darn. What would happen? <laughs> Would the passengers without oxygen masks fall unconscious? Would it just be a little windy, but you know, not a, not a problem besides that? Would anything small be sucked out of the door or would the wings of the plane fall off? There would be some consequences. What would those consequences be? I'm seeing two categories getting a lot of votes, one getting lots. One's definitely particular. getting the most. And you can pick more than one. If you think more than one of these is likely, go ahead and pick more than one. All right. Ooh. I'm gonna go ahead and finish and reveal. They said A and C, that is correct. So the pass passengers correct. would really be struggling to breathe and could even drop unconscious. Yes, and, and I'll say they the passengers wouldn't fall unconscious immediately. It would take a couple minutes before the oxygen levels would get so low that you would lose consciousness. But at 35,000 feet, there is not enough oxygen for us to stay conscious. We, we You would faint. And anything small would be sucked out the door. Just like if you blow up a balloon and then let go, all the air in the balloon rushes out. An airplane is kind of like a balloon. It's pressurized. pressurized. There's more <laughs> air inside than there is outside. And so if a door or a window broke open, a lot of air would rush out of the plane and anything small that's able to float around would go out with it. So it gets pushed out. Uh, is that that's kind of the same as getting yes. sucked out just from the other perspective? Yeah, when there's a ah. difference in pressure, then things are going to move from high pressure to low pressure. So I've seen the movie right. I I Incredibles two, and at the end, I hope I'm not spoiling this for anyone. The the bad guy tr tries to fly way up high where there's no air, and Elastigirl's in trouble. Is that what's going on? Is that so, the air is so thin? Yeah, in in real life, if you were in a fighter jet and you don't have an oxygen mask, you you'll be in trouble. You'll be you'll pass out because there's not enough oxygen. But math, that I think you're just trying to get out of your floss chicken dance. What? Because what? they won. Man. <laughs> Let's see it. A floss chicken. All right, here goes. Good job, you guys. You got the questions right. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Got to practice that. Got to stretch out before it too. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to answer a couple of questions because I've got our moderators have been gathering questions and they've put several into a document for me and I see some really good ones. So real fast, um, science. Uh, oh, great question from Amaya in the UK. Science, uh, she says that um, ozone messes up the DNA. So if we went up into the ozone layer, would we come back down a new person? Would our DNA change? Mm. This is a great question. There's a difference between DNA changes that you see in cartoons and superhero movies and DNA damage that happens in real life. In real life, radioactivity damages our DNA in ways that, that generally just make it so it's so much more likely that you'll get cancer. 
or they cause and, problems. And it's different cells that are being damaged in different ways, right? So yes. it's not like the whole body is changing what you, you're like. It's just that certain cells certain are getting cells. damaged. So if you went up into the ozone layer first, you wouldn't be able to breathe because the air is so thin. But if you took all that, that air from the ozone layer and a lot of ozone, and then we're breathing in ozone, that would cause a lot of damage to your lungs. So, and you would be at higher risk of lung cancer. Um, another good question from Logan, from Noah in Utah, what would happen and how do you feel when you go from a high elevation to a low elevation really fast? Good question. Cause we covered, you know, if you go from low to high really fast, you don't have enough oxygen. We traveled to Hawaii a couple of years ago and did, we went from sea level up to the research station on Mauna Loa and then back down. We did that a couple of times. And I found when you go up, you might get a little bit of a headache and just feel a little bit out of breath. And when I came down, I felt like almost like the air was too heavy. <laughs> and, and that was just kind of my personal feeling. Like it felt like, oh, it just feels kind of muggy and the air feels heavy. Well, if you do it really fast, if you've ever flown on a plane before and you come down to land, it might ears hurt. Is, is that because of the pressure? Yes, yes. You, you can get pressure build up in your ears and it hurts quite a bit until your ears adjust. So that, that's one thing that can happen. Um, two more questions real fast. Um, Jenna Par Parmeter asks, would people from the high cities have the same reaction if they went to a low lower city? This is kind of a similar question from, from Kylie. They, it, it's definitely easier on your body to go from high to low. So from high to low, you, if you do it fast, you have your ears adjust. Same thing can happen from going from low to high though. And then, um, you might just feel like it feels kind of muggy, but you're not going to pass out. You're not going to have problems. You're going to have more oxygen and it's, it's just at a healthy level of oxygen. Yeah. So you have more oxygen. And if you're used to, like, if you have always lived at 13,000 feet above sea level, and then you drop to sea level, all of a sudden your body is going to say, uh Oh, our blood is too thick. We need to make our blood thinner. And uh Oh, we have way more hemoglobin that we need. Let's get rid of some of this. So your body will make those adjustments, but it's not going to be, you know, you won't faint. So we found like scholars had a really interesting question. Um, why does it get colder if heat is rising? Oh, I love this question. It's because of pressure. And we're going to talk about this more next Wednesday and mm. Friday. When you have um, air molecules in a space, they have a certain amount of energy. They're moving around and that energy and how they move, that's the temperature. If the space expands, the pressure drops. And whenever the pressure drops, the temperature drops true, drops too. So it's true, hot air rises. But as the hot air is rising, it's spreading apart. And that spreading apart and the air getting thinner, that makes it cool down. So that's why it is lower pressure and lower temperature as you go higher. That makes a lot of sense. I did not know that. Um, one more qu question real quick from Malcolm. Is it because of the atmosphere that the sky is blue? Yes. And more specifically, it's because of oxygen and nitrogen in our atmosphere that the sky is blue, because those two gases tend to absorb and then reflect different wavelengths of light. And the color that they that they reflect off is blue. Good question. All wow. right. So we seeing the atmosphere from space like this is very different than just going outside and, and, and looking up. And boy, you just think that it goes forever. And it was really weird when you're saying it was only thick, like an apple peel on, on an apple because that's so thin. It I, is. It is. Our atmosphere really is thin compared to the size of the earth. But compared to us, compared to us, it's it's really quite big. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed learning more about the atmosphere today. And I'll give just a quick reminder that we don't have class on Monday because Monday is a holiday in the United States. So no class on Monday. But then this next Wednesday, we're going to be back with learning more about air pressure and the layers of our atmosphere. And then on it, next Friday, we have our first art project day. Oh, yes. Thank you, Matt. Dad. We have some birthday shout outs. We do have birthday shout outs real quick. A very happy birthday to Emily who turns 10 on January 18th, Monday when we have no class. So happy birthday, um, Emily on Monday. And Noah from Moab, Utah turns nine years old on Monday as well. Happy birthday, Noah. Happy birthday to Sirsha, who turned eight last week, and to Hadley, who turned eight yesterday. Happy birthday, you guys. Nice Work to hard, grow smart, and we will see you next week.